Hello everyone, welcome to MTX Chess. In this video, we do a deep dive into the Rui Lopez, which starts off with e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop b5, something we've all seen before. Rui Lopez de Segura was a Spanish priest in the 16th century who popularized this opening. In fact, Rui Lopez used this very opening to defeat a series of Italian chess masters in the mid-1500s. The thumbnail for this video is an incredibly beautiful painting by artist Luigi Massini. It depicts the famous 1560 chess match in Rome where Rui Lopez beat Giovanni Leonardo de Bona, a preeminent Italian master at the time. A big win for Spain. The painting's from 1871 and it's linked in the description. Definitely check it out. It's really, really beautiful. In this video, we're going to talk about the closed variation of the Rui Lopez. We're going to talk about the open variation, the Berlin uh, defense, and also the Schliemann defense. So really all the most common responses for black to the Rui Lopez. So in this position right here, our baseline Rui Lopez decision, uh, position, black has a couple of responses. The most common response is a6, the Morphe defense, and we're going to talk about both the closed and open variations in that. The second most common is the Berlin defense, which happens after knight f6. And then the third most common, and what I think you should be playing as black, is f5, which is a really, really fantastic uh, aggressive line called the Schliemann defense. So we'll talk about all these today. So our uh, first defense is a6, the Morphe defense. And what do you do here as um, what do you do here as white? So there's really two moves for white. White can either move the bishop back to a4, or white can exchange the uh, bishop for the for the knight. So let's say uh, you exchange. Black's going to take back with their d-pawn. It gets their queen into the game. It, it allows their queen to be active, and it brings their bishop into the game, right? And as white, you might be tempted to pick this pawn off. The problem, though, is after knight takes uh, e5, you get something like queen d4, and this is a huge problem for white. The knight's going to move back, and the pawn's going to fall. So in the rule Lopez, you've got to be aware as white that you can't always capture on c6 and, um, and, then, and then just pick this pawn off. So in these kinds of games, these exchange variation games, what the plan for white is here is white's going to eventually push d4, get the uh, deep white's d-pawn exchanged for black's e-pawn, and then white's going to try and win in the end game with a king side pawn majority, where it'll be four white side, uh, white king side pawns versus three black king side pawns. So that's kind of the gist of the exchange variation. You don't see it that much, especially as you get a little bit uh, to the higher levels of chess. And so we're going to spend most of our time today really talking about what happens after bishop a4. So here, uh, black continues with knight f6, just getting their development out, and white plays castle king side. You may be wondering, oh my goodness, this pawn is hanging, and we'll talk about this in a second. That's kind of, uh, if, if black decides to take this pawn, that's what leads us into the open variation. We're going to start with the close today. If, you did, if you're not comfortable castling because you feel like this pawn is too much of a liability, white can always play d3. Uh, although in the Rui Lopez, one of the main themes for white is pushing this d-pawn all the way to d4 in one fell swoop, so playing d3 is a little bit of a slow move. So after castle kingside, uh, we get bishop e7 from black, and once bishop e7 gets played, we know we're going into the closed Rui Lopez. If white, if black wanted to open it up and play the open Rui Lopez, they would have captured this pawn. We'll talk about that later. After bishop e7, rook e1, one, showing up that weak pawn, we get b5 from black, just pushing this bishop back, and bishop b3. And if you've watched any Grandmaster games, you know that uh, this is a position that you see uh, time and time again. This is a very, very common position in the Rui Lopez. And black has really two moves here. Black can either play d6, and we can just continue with the closed variation of the Rui Lopez, or black can castle kingside. And what castling kingside does is it invites the possibility of the martial attack. So if you remember from our coverage of the Carlson uh, Nepomniachtchi World Chess Championship earlier this year. This position, this exact position, was reached probably four or five times in their in their 12 game match, and uh, Nepo played uh, anything in this position with white. The white pieces Nepo played either h3. He even played uh, a4 a couple times, and um, what he was avoiding is something called the martial attack. And the martial attack is a very well studied attack, and it happens in this position after Black castles and White plays c3. And I'll just show you some of the major lines. After c3 from white, you get d5 from black. And here's the attack. Black kind of uh, trying to blow a hole in the center. Very famously uh, first played by John Marshall against uh, Capablanca way back, I don't know, maybe the 20s or 30s. And uh, the way this was proceeded, I'll just show you some lines to show you how sharp this can get. After e takes d5, you get knight takes d5. And what black has basically done is they're giving up this pawn. So after knight takes e5, knight takes e5, rook takes e5, um, Black's going to have a very nice attack after shoring up this, this knight. White's going to shore up their rook. 
but then black gets this bishop on this really fantastic diagonal. So after the rook retreats, the queen's coming out to h4, and you can see already that you're getting, uh, black has a lot of pressure on um, the white king side. If you don't know what you're doing as white in this situation, there is tremendous potential to blunder. Obviously, the best move for white here is going to be something like g3, even though that weakens the dark squares around the white king. g3 is the safest move. You don't want to play a move like h3 is white, because then uh, black is going to have this bishop sacrifice, and now uh, black is threatening um, something pretty close to checkmate here, and there's not really a uh, great way to defend this without uh, losing material. So um, the martial attack, something uh, to look out for, especially if you're in this position and black uh, elects to castle. Be aware that c3 could be met with d5 after black castles. Um, but let's say black wants to continue just with the closed jewelry. Uh, a move like d6 is really what you're going to see. And now white can play c3, and after castle kingside from black, before white pushes this d4 move, which white really wants to push this d4 move and kind of um, establish a little bit more strength in the center, you have to make sure as white that you're shoring up this weak g4 square by playing a move like h3. And now the black bishop is not going to come to g4 and pin your knight to your queen. If you're white and you forget to play h3, and it's this position right here, and you instead play d4, now black's going to play bishop g4. And all of a sudden, your d4 square is very weak. Like if you if white played h3 now, uh, a move too late, after takes, takes, black black's going to end up, uh, excuse me, after takes, takes, black's going to end up winning this pawn back with a move like uh, knight takes d4. So it's really important to get the sequence right if you're playing white. Before you push d4 in this kind of position, you need to play h3. That's just going to keep you from getting a bunch of headaches later on. And so here we're kind of reaching the end of the opening for, for both white and for black. Um, both sides are castled. A fair number of pieces are developed. And this is a very fluid position for black. There's a couple different variations. The idea is that black eventually wants to push this C pawn and uh, use the C pawn and the E pawn together to uh, fight for control of this D4 square. And so there's a couple ways black could do that. And we've seen grandmasters um, do it a number of different ways. So black could play what's called the, the Bri variation, where they play back to uh, knight b8 and then relocate the knight to d7. They put the bishop on uh, b7 and then eventually push the pawn to c5. Or probably the more common, they'll play the knight out to a5. And after the bishop comes back to um, c2, white doesn't want to give up their, their light square bishop. Uh, you'll get a move like c5. And this is really the end of the opening stage. Uh, black has established nice control of this d4 square. White is still going to fight for this square, so a move like d4 might get played, and after c takes d4, c takes d4. And uh, the opening is really over here. The plan for um, for white is going to be to develop their knight, usually like uh, to d2 and then to f1, and then from f1 it can go either to g3 or to e3, and these are both great squares for this knight over here. And then uh, the queen, the black side, black black's pieces, they might be moving their queen to uh, c7. They might be getting their rook on the semi-open file. This rook might be coming to e1 or even to, or I'm sorry, e8 or even d8. And it's it's not uncommon for the black rook to come to e8 and the bishop to get, get tucked away in this um, this f8 square. There are even variations where black will bring their bishop back to f8, push g6, and then bring the bishop to, to g7. So very fluid position for both white and black. One of the most common positions you'll see at the at the super GM level. Uh, it's very well studied, and we know kind of a lot of the, the, the variations and main lines for both sides. So that is the the nuts and bolts of the Rui Lopez closed. So now we'll talk about the Rui Lopez open. So if we go back to this position right here, so this is our starting Rui Lopez position. We get the Morphe defense from, from black. Bishop come back to a4, we get knight of six, and we get castle kingside from white. And if you remember from what we were talking about earlier, we were saying that if black chooses to capture this pawn with the knight, then that leads to the Rui Lopez open. So that is exactly what black does in this scenario. And it may look really bad, like, oh my goodness, white is giving up one of their central pawns. The reality is, though, that now this E file becomes a semi-open file. There's only one pawn on this file, and white can use that to really put some pressure on the black king here uh, early on. And so the move here for white, if you understand that this is, is a semi-open file and the goal is to open up this file to pressure the black king, it really makes sense that the best move for white in this position is D4. The idea being that if the pawn comes off this file, if black's E pawn comes off the E file, then white is just going to have a heyday attacking and pinning this knight. Here, the best move for black is something like b5. Um, it, we'll just go back though and show, like for instance, if e does take d4, we can get rook d1. This is called the um, the Riga variation if black does go for uh, e takes d4. And I just want to show you how sharp this variation can get. After rook e1, black's got to like shore up the, the knight with a move like d5. And here, white can just do uh, knight takes d4. Now you got a lot of pressure coming this way. And... Uh, 
After move like bishop d6, black bringing pieces into the attack, you get knight takes c6. And so what, what white's doing here is they're setting up basically a discovered attack to the king. But black has this awesome tactic where they'll play bishop takes h2 check, and after king h1, the queen is going to come to h4. And uh, now there's just a bunch of nasty stuff being threatened. Obviously, um, if, if this knight ever gets unpinned, the knight could always come to f2 and threaten check. And so the way white gets out of this is really interesting. Rook takes e4 check, right? So sacrificing the exchange, basically. And after d takes e4, queen d8 check. And so the queen obviously protects here, right? So you get an exchange of queens. Queen takes d8, knight takes d8, king takes d8, and then king takes h2. So a pretty wild line right there. Um, white sacrificing the exchange and then uh, going for the, the queen trade with the double check. Really interesting. I think in this position right here, if we if we just look at the pieces, Black's obviously has that exchange, right? So White only has one rook on the board, but Black has three minor pieces to Black's single minor piece. So I think a lot of grandmasters would say, and I think even a lot of intermediate and advanced players would prefer to have White in this position just because you're going to have more mobility with your minor pieces. So the Riga variation, not something you see a ton, especially because if if White knows the the main line, they can kind of get away into this kind of position where they have a much better end game. And so uh, if we go back to this position, we just talked about the Riga variation, which is when uh, black chooses to take on, on d4. But a better move for black is simply b5. And after bishop coming back to b3, we're going to get d5 from black, uh, again, shoring up this e4 knight. And after d takes e5, we get bishop e6. Black does not want to capture this pawn uh, back or even move the, maneuver the queen to capture this pawn back uh, because it's in black's interest to have a pawn on this uh, file as long as their king is still in the center. So after bishop e6, we can get knight uh, bd2 kind of uh, threatening this knight. And uh, the move for black here is knight c5. And now kind of our opening is a little bit over. Uh, obviously, there's really no way for a white to hold on to the bishop pair. So white could lose the bishop pair. But this knight's really in a nice outpost. And um, the way development would proceed is this pawn could come up. Uh, to, to c3, taking away these squares from uh, the knight here on c6. The rook could come over, the queen coming to e2. Um, this knight could come to f1 and then up here. And the bishop will eventually come out to a nice square and the queen will get involved and the other rook will get involved. So uh, really, really interesting um, kind of line of the Rui Lopez, a lot different from the close variation. I think playing black, I really enjoy playing the open variation. And that's simply because you just get a lot more mobility with your pieces. I like having this really active knight on c5. And uh, that's really the open variation of the Rui Lopez. If you know your variations really well, I do encourage you to try out the Riga if you get into that position. Uh, just remember that if uh, white knows their stuff, then you're going to find yourself in a kind of a hard end game to play. All right, so the next variation I want to discuss is the Berlin defense. And so we'll just get into our Rui Lopez here. And the Berlin defense, uh, as late as like the 1930s, was was not really thought of as a great opening. Emmanuel Lasker famously uh, trashed this uh, trashed this opening. said said it was it was worse for Black. Um, Kramnik really revived this. Vladimir Kramnik, the world champion, famously revived this against Kasparov in their 2000 World Chess Championship match, and really did a fantastic job defending with Black. So. Um, this is the Berlin defense move, knight f6. So but previously we were talking about the Morphe defense where black plays a6, but in the Berlin defense, black plays knight f6. And so after white castles kingside, the idea with the Berlin defense uh, is to capture on e4. If you are white and you're in this position right here and you don't want to uh, allow black to capture on e4 with the Berlin defense, you could play a move like d3. And we already talked about how d3 is a little bit of a slow move because white eventually wants to move all the way out to d4. And so the way black could respond to this is by putting their bishop on c5. And uh, this can get really, really nasty for, for white if white makes any mistakes in this position. For instance, if white uh, gets greedy and tries to pick off this pawn, something like bishop takes c6, after d takes c6, white might think that this pawn is uh, hanging, but after knight takes e5, queen d4. And now uh, the uh, black queen is threatening checkmate and uh, threatening this knight. So it's kind of a fork here. Uh, if you do so, some stupid move like this, obviously this is going to be checkmate. So not something you want to go for as white. So just remember, do not exchange here. Just continue developing. Casting is probably your best bet in this position. But let's go back. Let's say uh, white is not afraid of the uh, Berlin defense. And so in this position, instead of playing d3, they choose to castle. The way uh, the Berlin works, uh, the next couple moves are basically just played out moves. You almost never see any variation. The people who play this really know uh, what the moves are. So after knight e4, knight takes e4, you're going to get d4. Again, that same kind of concept we were talking about in the open Rui, where you want to open up this e, e file by uh, attacking with your d-pawn. And here, black's going to play knight d6. And the idea is that this pushes pressure on the puts pressure on the bishop and asks white, what are you going to do with the bishop? After bishop takes c6, d takes c6, d takes e5. 
and uh, the move for black here is knight f5. And you may be wondering, oh my goodness, what happens after queen takes d8? King takes d8. Has it black, black lost their ability to castle? Yes, black has lost their ability to castle. Um, but the reality is this is an incredibly well-studied line. And even after things like uh, rook d1 check, uh, black has really, really good uh, chances here in the endgame. And we've seen players like Magnus Carlsen, Fabiana Caruana, Kram, Nick Kasparov, um, all these guys play both white and black and win with both white and black uh, out, of, out of this main line and out of this position. So the Berlin defense, extremely solid. Some ideas for, um, for black here generally are um, going to be, you can move, uh, Magnus Carlsen's won a couple games where he's he's moved the knight back, his black. Um, you can always uh, push these pawns, kind of tuck the king away over here and bring this bishop to, uh, bring this bishop up to a nicer square. And what white's trying to do uh, is, is get their uh, pieces active as fast as they possibly can. So that is the Berlin defense of the, um, the Rue Lopez. It should just be called the Berlin Wall. And I think over time, this really has become the main line of the, of, uh, the Rue Lopez. A lot of players, um, studying this endgame extensively and using this to win at the highest levels. The final variation of the Rui Lopez we're going to talk about is the Schliemann defense, which is a really interesting defense for black that I think everyone should play. And um, we've talked about uh, a6, we've talked about knight f6, and the third most common um, move in this position based on the database is actually f5. And this is a really interesting move. If you're playing white and you play the Rui Lopez pretty frequently, you probably don't see this that much. The reality is that this is a great move and at least in some extremely, extremely sharp positions. And what do you do here, here as, um, what do you do here as black? So, the, or what do you do here as white rather? The best move for white is really just to develop their pieces with a move like knight c3 um, to kind of protect this pawn. And the idea for black here is that you're giving up a flank pawn for white center pawn. So if uh, white plays the correct move, which is knight c3, you want to exchange pawns and after the knight comes here, you can push d5 and get yourself a nice uh, big center. And there's a couple different um, really, really sharp tactical variations where um, after takes here, uh, you uh, you take the knight here and you kind of let um, you kind of let white get get into this position and the queen is going to come to g4 and kind of wreak some havoc over here. Really sharp tactical stuff. But the, most of the time, white is not really going to know what to do in this position. And that's why it's one of the fun things. It's one of the fun lines to play. And so, uh, for instance, like if, if white made the very common mistake of uh, taking this knight and then going after uh, this pawn right here, the black queen is going to be coming to d4, right? So this is a theme in the Marie Lopez. And as white, you may be thinking, well, it's okay because I can just bring my queen out to h5, and even if they, and, you know, check, and even if they block with the g pawn, I'll have knight takes g6. The problem, though, is that this queen on d4 protects this rook. So after h takes g6, now white has lost a knight. Even after queen uh, takes g6, we're going to get something like king, uh, king d8. And now what do you do as white? You could castle. The problem with castling, though, is as soon as you castle, black has a move like bishop d6, and now... Uh, I mean, what do you do now? This is just miserable. Your king is immediately under attack. You could play a move like uh, d3 and preparing to get the uh, the bishop into the game. The problem, though, is that uh, the knight could come here, and uh, even after um, the bishop comes up, different moves like this, you know, black's not black's not uh, really that much worse here, and uh, black is always going to have really good attacking chances on the king side. So, an exciting variation if you kind of know what you're doing. I think um, more people should be playing the Schliemann. It leads to just some really sharp tactical uh, tactical games where uh, there's chances for both sides. And if you know your stuff, I think you can um, come out on top pretty frequently. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Today we talked about the closed variation of the Rui Lopez, the open variation, the uh, Berlin defense, and the Schliemann defense. I think these are all, whether you're playing open, closed, or any really any of these, they're all great options in the Rui Lopez. If you haven't played the Rui Lopez yet, then... Um, you probably haven't played that much chess because this really is the most common opening all the way from the beginner level up to the super GM level. It's probably the best opening in chess and certainly the um, the best uh, kind of way for uh, white to try and get an advantage after e4, e5. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching these videos. I'm really overwhelmed by the support this channel has gotten. Please like and subscribe and uh, tell your friends about this channel. So I'll see you guys next week.